Safari goes this afternoon, Shamel, and you are also excited by the prospects of seeing the Anderson Mail. I've only seen him twice, and I think Brent may have seen him once, so we haven't seen him very many times, and he's an incredibly spectacular specimen. He's very big, and he's got a serious reputation, so it'll be wonderful to be able to get to spend a little bit more time with him. Interesting, I've been chatting with some of the other guides who get to see him more frequently than we do, and they say he's a little bit timid, not as relaxed as Tingana, the dominant male leopard that we now see more often than any other, and they actually often limit the sighting to a two-vehicle sighting. As soon as there's a third vehicle, he tends to try and slink off, and he's not quite himself. So that's something quite interesting that I actually didn't know. So they 
occasionally limits its sightings to only two vehicles as opposed to the regular three. But I'm sure over time, like with most of the animals, gentle habituation, slowly reassuring these animals that all we want to do is watch them, will hopefully cause them to become a little bit more relaxed. And if it doesn't, well, you know, it also just emphasizes the fact that just like humans, all animals have got their own different personalities, their own different traits. They're also allowed to be in a bad mood one day, in a better mood on the next. So something very important to remember when ever thinking about these wild animals or asking questions about them, we too are wild animals. We've just kind of, I guess, domesticated ourselves a little bit. Um, but we too are animals, and just like the wild animals that roam the entire planet, not just Africa, each will be slightly different to the next. I guess a great example for some of the viewers who've been following from earlier last year would be the differences between Kunyuma and Quarantine. Two brothers, two leopards, both born to the same mother, exposed to all likely just about all the same human interactions as they grew up. Yet the one young boy, old Kunyuma, had a tendency to snarl at the vehicles from time to time. And he also had the kind of similar tendencies to what the Anderson male seems to have. And that is that as you may find them, they will try and slink off and try and lose you in the bush just for a minute or two. I mean, nothing serious. They're not like running for their lives, but they will try and throw you off temporarily before moving on. I've just found a spot on the road here where it looks like a hyena's been sleeping, so I just want to take a closer look here. Okay. So you can see how the, the sand has been quite disturbed and flattened, and that's something useful to look for when, when tracking animals. If we look over here, we can tell which animal was responsible for leaving this track in the ground. And I can see that the track has got two lobes on the back pad, and also that the toes cut into one another. So there's the kind of banana-shaped toes of a hyena. We can't see the claw marks very clearly here because the ground's a little bit hard, so it didn't show that. But nice to know that a hyena had a snooze here last night. And it could well have been a leopard or a lion or something else. So just useful to check any obscurities on the ground. across to Arethusa and while we do that you guys are about to head in the opposite direction you're going to be heading back east to James who's currently at Orwatol. There everybody is a hippopotamus and he greets you with a fondness from here in the Juma Dam. He is eating a little bit of the last greenery there. Welcome to the sunset safari and as Jamie said the other day, the sun cannot set soon enough. Actually it hasn't been too hot today. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have got Brian Joubert. Hello Brian. Hello dear. Yes, very nice. That's his thumb. Painted splendiferously as a, what is it today? Oh, a nice little flower. That's very pretty, Brian. Thank you. Right. Uh, yes, I didn't really know what to say to that. We are, of course, live, as you know. Hashtag Safari Live. You want to talk to us on Twitter. Questions at wildearth.tv. If you want to talk to us on email, that hippopotamus is now eating elephant dung. That's quite common. I've never seen it before. I've read about it often. But because they normally feed at night, I've never actually seen it, but he's eating, he's picking up elephant dung. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, it's fantastic to see. I'm glad I'm not the one eating the elephant dung. An elephant, of course, is an incredibly um, 
inefficient digestive system, and that means that there's lots of good nutrition, probably quite a lot of good bacteria as well that resides in its dung. And if you happen to be a hungry hippopotamus like Huberta over here, that's called alliteration, Brian, um, then elephant dung is an excellent option for you. Ooh, that's a big piece. There you go. Mmm, oh, didn't like that one. I'm trying to eat these last bits of greenery that are in the dams. There's quite a lot of it in the, in the uh, Biffles Hook Dam, but nobody has pitched up to eat it yet. Foaming at the mouth. I think that's just from the constant movement of the jaws. Looks totally unwieldy, doesn't it? <laughs> Good grief. Oh, thank you, Brian. Oh, excuse me, everybody. Hashtag Safari Live, bless you. I'm okay now. Just a, a brief sneezing. So Brian was also just pointing out that this hippopotamus is not looking particularly fantastic. He's got his hips sticking out, his spine is sticking out. It's not surprising at all. I've looked at the long-term forecast of the weather for the week, and it doesn't look like there's going to be anything by way of rain. And so I think we're still in for some pretty dry times. And apparently the Kruger Park is looking fairly horrendous if you, you know, if you are making good and bad judgments on these things. But it's looking very dry indeed. And I did see a picture the other day posted of a hippopotamus that had died as a result of the fact that it could not get to water in time. Anyway, I'm afraid we need to gird our loins for that sort of thing, because it's going to get pretty rough out here. Hello, Charlotte. You're living in Port Elizabeth, just 125 kilometers from where my parents are currently possibly in, about to go down to the river and have a, have a sundowner. Um, Charlotte, you want to know how it is that the zoomies find the animals? Uh, well, I think what they do, you want to know if it's infrared or if it's a sound, infrared at night. Um, Charlotte, basically, yes, there is infrared at night. That does happen absolutely. But I think or it's, it's just moving the camera about until you spot something and then zooming in. So the easiest thing to do would be to zoom all the way out, pan the camera around from side to side until you see something, and then zoom in on it. Uh, they can't, you can sort of find direction from the the sound. There are two microphones, so it does give a stereo feed, a left and right feed. So, yeah, you could possibly find um, them from, find uh, animals from the sound, but perhaps let's put that out to any zoomies that are watching. You let us know how you find animals. I sat in the final control for quite a long time today uh, during the sort of heat of the day, and I watched some wonderful stuff going on at the dam. There were warthogs and buffalo and elephants and this hippo around. So it was very entertaining, and the Zoomie did a fantastic job of panning to and from. And it's not easy, of course, because the, it is slightly delayed. The movement of the camera uh, is, is definitely slightly delayed. So while you're seeing it in just about live time, the movement of the camera is probably about 10 to 20 seconds behind. Uh, your, so the movement of the, of the actual Zoomie. Right, let's move on. We are going to go and see if we can see those lions, I think. Oh, there's a nice piece of greenery, totally rejected. That's interesting. So even this hippo, with its great big fat mouth, is being very selective about what it eats. Oxpeck is enjoying quite a good time there with him. So let's just sit here for a little bit longer. So, Regina, a brilliant question, just dovetailing quite nicely with what I was saying there. 
you say they've got very wide mouths and that is, would seem to be a disadvantage if you were a grazer, surely. Um, and is there is any evolutionary reason for why they should have such a wide mouth? Regina, the reason is that they are what we call bulk grazers. So they're not normally particularly selective. So they're not concentrate feeders like something like a diker or a steenbok, which will pick, you know, individual shoots. While it certainly will reject certain plants, that uh, mouth is ideally suited to eating enormous amounts of vegetation quite quickly. And that's why you get these lawns around where hippo live, and they crop the grass very nice and short. I don't think they're particularly fussy about the species of grass they eat, unlike something much smaller like a steenbok or a diker. And so that's why they don't need a sort of prehensile tip to the mouth. I'm sure there's also an element of, you know, their, their defense that they use. They've obviously got those huge mouths to show territorial behavior and also to defend themselves. <clears throat> All right, Brian, you hippo down. Let's carry on. Over the damn wall we go. I'd also like to spend a bit of time at the hyena den later on today. I don't want to go there too late because it seems to me that sort of 20 minutes before dark, the adults go away and then the youngsters move out. And so I'd like to go there probably around six o'clock. We'll see what happens there. Um, I still haven't seen the two littly, littly ones there, which is very distressing to my person. Just the two D November, but the two Jans I have yet to see. Mm -hmm. Bit of a bumpy road, yes. But for now, let us go down Twin Dams Road for a little while, and then we're going to head across to the far east. Hello, Donna. Apparently there was a hyena this morning with a cut on its neck, and you're concerned about it. I don't know where it is at the moment, Donna, but we'll certainly look out for it, and perhaps it's returned to the den. I'm not sure where you saw it but we'll keep an eye out for it. It's interesting that it had a cut on the neck. I would imagine a lion probably, or I guess another hyena, quite possible. Was it a male or a female, Donna? That would be quite interesting to know. And the males we know now do a lot more foraging outside of the territory than the females would. So I believe it was at the den first and then at the Gallego pan. Right. Now, the other surprising thing about this year, or not surprising, I suppose, I guess, slightly sad thing about this year is that as far as bird breeding goes, I think it's been a particularly slow year. And I haven't seen a lot of newly fledged birds, quite a lot of uh, hornbills, but otherwise not. And then there's that Wahlberg's nest up here. And I don't know that they managed to raise it. Oh, hang on a second. Hang on a second, hang on, hang on, hang on, Brian. Let's have a look in there. Let me get my binoculars out. Try not to blind myself with the sun. No, no, that's just a barky type of stick there. But I haven't seen a youngster in this nest. Have you, Brian? No. You haven't seen one either. So I'm not sure that the two pale form Wahlbergs that live at um, number one Wahlberg Street have managed to produce a youngster this year, which, I mean, most years I suppose they would in good, year, good years of rain. They certainly came to the nest. They certainly spent some time here. There's another pair just down the road. I haven't seen a chick in their nest either. see the very, very pale sky. And when I came out of the final control earlier today at about, what time would it have been? Probably about half past one. The sky was almost white. 
There was no, and I thought it was, I actually thought it was clouding over until I saw that I was casting a shadow. And it was just pale, pale, pale white with a very slight tinge of blue. There's no moisture in the air at all. All righty, let's head across to Scott. I think he's headed on to Arethusa. We'll get an update from him and I will see you in the west. East, east, I'll see you in the east. So here we are on the kind of western edge of Juma, about to cross over onto Arethusa. Uh, for those of you who may be new, get to traverse two different portions or lodges, properties here in the Sabi Sands, one called Juma and the other one called Arethusa. And even though we as humans may have boundaries to abide to, the animals don't. And that's something that's very important to remember. This is a massive, massive ecosystem where animals have free reign over 3.9 million hectares, as Jamie said the other day, a good way of kind of making that a little bit more of a tangible figure is it's basically 4 million football fields all stacked up together with Africa's wild game roaming as they please throughout. So in this portion of the area of our traverse, we could bump into a female leopard called Shadow. Just trying to keep you guys updated on, on, in terms of the leopards' territories, how they kind of work, and who we could bump into leopard-wise, as we are hoping to hunt down the Anderson male, a uh, big male leopard who occurs right to the west of our area of Travis. How it works with leopards is that usually a dominant male will have, in this area of Africa, at least will have about four or five females within his very large territory. So, like I said, he'll have a large territory of anywhere between about five, 6,000 hectares, roughly. And he may have about four or five females, each with about 1,000, just over 1,000 hectares for their territory within his. And it's the females that compete with one another for their territories and the males that compete between one another for theirs. No different to lions between the males and also the prides of lioness. Hi there, Jack. You'd like to know a little bit about another leopard that I haven't discussed yet this afternoon. And her name is Karuna. And Hopefully, Jack, we are going to get to see her soon, but we're not going to be able to go into that den site just yet. So for those of you who are new, again, an important update, this female leopard that we are talking about, we've got confirmed viewings of at least one tiny little fluff ball of a cub, and that was by Brent on Monday. jammed to a break there because I've found the leopard tracks of the daughter of the leopard we're talking about now, Shadow, I just mentioned earlier. And I'm just going to pull over here in order to show you. So there we go. You can see the toe marks in the front coming towards us. And I'm guessing these are from last night, but what I can tell already, and Jack, I'm going to get back to your question just after I've jumped out here. Um, but what I can tell is that these tracks are not fresh, or at least probably from sometime last night, and that's because they've been driven over. And if we look here, we can see only half of the track remains, whereas the other half of the track over here has been driven over. So I can just see a portion of it. So it's not from between drives, and it's all likely from sometime last night. But what that may mean is I'm just maybe going to snoop around you a little bit and try and work out where exactly she may have gone. Jack, back to your question regarding Karula and her cubs. Now, because we want to be as sensitive as possible and not in any way interfere or cause any concern to her, it's a stressful time raising little cubs, and it's also a very, very dangerous time for those cubs. 
So we want to eliminate ourselves from that scenario in case the unlikely event of us being there may contribute to a hyena coming in onto the scene or maybe Karula not hearing very clearly that the hyena is coming. I mean, again, even though the chances are very small that we are going to have a negative impact, we want to completely extract ourselves from the ch being involved in the remote chance of even seeing something horrible happening to those cubs. So what's going to happen on Tuesday? Uh, the Juma guides, Taxon uh, and Aubrey will be around and, and, and Brent and James and Jamie along with Taxon and, and Aubrey will go into that uh, den together, probably between drives when it's hot, when there's not likely an uh, opportunity for hyenas or lions to be on the move, and they'll kill leopard cubs if they find them. So they're just going to plan it very uh, carefully, go in there, have a quick look, see if she's still uh, denning in that same spot, uh, and also maybe see how many cubs are in fact there. So there could be maybe even three cubs, uh, probably at the most, but in all likelihood, just one or two will be there on, on average. But yeah, like I said, we don't want to in any way interfere with uh, what's going on. And in all likelihood, Jack, from about a month of age, will be the time when um, we can start viewing them more readily, but it all depends on many, many variables. Where the den site is, she is in all likelihood going to move it between now and then. So we'll keep you updated. It's obviously kind of torture knowing that there are these cute little cubs there, but like I said, we don't want to get too excited and ruin what could be a wonderful, wonderful few months going forward. jump out again here yeah, and try and work out where she's gone. Obviously it's not going to be hugely easy because vehicles have driven here and therefore you raise the tracks on the ground. Well, no joy, sadly, um, but not a problem. What I'm, what I'm thinking of doing is maybe continuing away from these tracks. We are going to come back in this direction a little bit later once it's cooled down. So we'll just keep in mind that she was moving in this general area sometime last night. And we're going to continue to the west with our initial goals of hopefully finding a big male leopard. And when we come back towards Juma a little bit later on, we'll be sure to find her in this area. South Carolina and on the topics of tracks, are you interested to know how a hippo's footprint will compare to that of an elephant's footprint? Well, let's uh, just for this uh, scenario, Donna, say that we're going to be assuming a big hippo bull versus a big elephant bull. And a big hippo bull's tracks would be about, I would say, probably, Donna, about... 10 inches in diameter. So kind of that, that size in diameter. Whereas a big elephant bull, its tracks will be uh, as much as 20 inches long. Um, and my fingers are together are about 12 inches like that. So uh, an extra finger on top, I mean massive. Some up into their, their mid 20s, 23, 24 inches lengthways and about 
12 inches, maybe 15 inches across. So an elephant bull's track is going to be double, triple the size of a hippo bull's tracks. And it's also going to lack the four very clear toenails that are seen, or toes, uh, rather, of, of a hippo. The elephants have got no toe prints evidence. Even though they've got toenails, they have no impact on the elephant's track at all. And what I would like to do is if we do obviously find some nice hippo tracks and or elephant tracks, we will show you. But even if a hippo or elephant had have walked down this road, it's not the best substrate to see the tracks in. So you'll have to just wait for the right time in order to show you clearly what's going on there. today there's always a chance anything can happen out here Nigel so there's always a chance every single day of seeing the dogs the cats you name it but I don't think the prospects are, are very good I've heard no updates exactly as to where they are and if they were on Arethusa or surrounds I would have got the message on the updates group on our whatsapp group and um, that updates all, uh, all the guides within the cyber sounds as to which animals have been moving where uh, always interesting to pop in at the little watering holes at this time of the year because there's often not much water in them and they are drying up incredibly incredibly quickly so Bleak times here in the drought-stricken Sabi Sands. But we may just be in luck because if we look to our right, we've got some animals approaching. Hello, Mr. Impala. And it's going to be interesting to watch them trying to drink. Now, what can happen at this stage of a drought, because the animals are so desperate to drink and because there's often a thick layer of mud between the water and the hard kind of ground, they may become stuck while trying to get into a suitable spot to drink, which is obviously incredibly difficult to just overlook, but it is gonna mean it's an easy meal for a predator that next comes through here. Let's see what happens here. Is there some water possibly? It looks like there may be a tiny little bit in maybe the hoof, buffalo hoof prints or kind of any imprint made by the larger animals that wallow like buffalo and elephants. Oh, well, it's lucky for now. It looks like it can kind of reach without getting those hooves too dirty. But not easy. You can see he's working his way around, trying to find a good spot. He's going to try and creep us forward a little bit see what happens as he continues. Now, this may spook him ever so slightly, but no, I think we're in luck. Ooh. Obviously, he's also on high alert, but doesn't look hugely concerned by the chance of predators being around. But that will be playing on the back of his mind. He knows he could be ambushed. Hello, boy. Shame, you're not having much luck here, are you? But it looks like this may be the right spot for you to have a drink. Come on. Yes, this is looking much better. Maybe it's the smell of the water. It could be quite rancid that's putting him off. But it, like I said, at desperate times, desperate measures will be taken just like that. Hippo eating its own dung a little bit earlier with James. Oh, 
interesting. I caught the wrong end of that message. But either way, the hippo wasn't eating his own dung, but eating the dung of elephant and buffalo is <clears throat> not hugely different, to be honest. Their dung comes out quite similar to one another. Well, it certainly doesn't appear like this guy's had any luck. Is he going to keep trying? He can definitely reach a lot of these water points, so I'm not sure why he's not having any luck. What's that little bird behind his head there? I need to get my binoculars onto it. Oh, beautiful. It's a golden-breasted bunting. Bright yellow chest, off it goes. And quite important to not overlook the smaller birds. At a glance from here, it didn't look very impressive. As soon as I got my binoculars onto it, it then revealed its beauty. Well, at least you're finding something to nibble on here, Mr. Impala. You're not finding the, the thirst quenching you were hoping for. in Philadelphia and Jean in North Carolina and you guys are wondering if there's been any sign of the one-horned impala as well as the one-eyed impala not that I've seen but I'm sure he's probably still around but I haven't seen him for quite some time Okay, well, I think it's time to leave this in pilot to try and work out what to do at the water hole, yeah? Good luck, buddy. <clears throat> well, the interesting thing is that just as the water is running out for these animals, it's going to be interesting to see if the water doesn't in fact run out for us humans, which is a reality. And if we run out of water, yeah, well then, that's going to be the end of the live safaris for a while. Oh, there's a massive water up here. Big bull, or boar rather, you can see he's got two growths, one growing out below his eye and another one just between his, that growth and his tusk. Obviously, behind those back legs, you can also clearly see why this is a bull. You can also see that he's been wallowing in the mud, probably just where we've come from. So we would have just missed him. Sadly, they don't really like to hang around very much for camera. I'm going to try and... Oh, here comes another one. Let's see if this doesn't change things here. His tusks have been broken and worn down over the ages. They don't look very, very big. And like I said, that could have been just from being worn down over time. And Andre Lucky has evidently calmed down now, and he is on his elbows. Yes, Jerry, I can copy you loud and clear. Just letting Jerry in the final control room know that I can copy her. As our comms are sometimes intermittent. Oh no, angle's not gonna work from here too well, but you can see he's on his elbows. Snacking away now, you can also see those wart-like protrusions which give them their name, the females only have one set growing out of each side of their face, not like the males who've got two. 
and it's very common pig behavior to forage on your elbows like that. It gives your head leverage to use that snout-like or shovel-like snout to dig up little roots and bulbs and the fresh green grassy shoots. Very good. Well, I'm glad we got to get a better than normal visual of what was a big water ball. All right, we're going to send you across to James now for an update on how he's getting along. And hopefully some more updates for you when you come back. Nothing. We've driven far, everybody. Back and far east. That's where we are now. Hoping to find some lions. But the pale, washed-out light of the droughtish summer low felt is proving difficult for the animals. Anyway, here we are. Scott seems to have been quite successful with an impala and a warthog. Ooh, Brian, there's a water buck. It's only about mm, 700 meters away. You might be able to get a speck spot. You see it there? So everybody, this won't be a long sighting. What we'll do is just show you how brilliantly camouflaged it is. And then we'll press on. There, you can see it moving. Not a classic sighting by any stretch of the imagination. But they're actually quite magnificent. I was reading up on them because we see quite a few of them here and I find that I seldom have much interesting to say about them. And what I did read, they look like they've got big shaggy coats. And apparently, although the hair is quite thick, it's actually quite sparse, and so it doesn't make them too hot at all. So that cleared up a bit of a mystery to me. I couldn't understand why on earth an antelope that lived out here, where the summer does get so hot, should maintain a coat like that, even in the hot summer months. There was another one, Brian. Our luck is, oh, our cup runneth over. And yes, you're absolutely right, um, Jerry. I think the comment comes from Jerry in Final Control that there might be some lions uh, close by to these, <laughs> close by to these water buck. Apparently, Brent this morning was uh, looking at water buck, and some lions just stood up in front of him, came out of the sun in front of him. What a wonderful surprise that was. We're not too far from where that occurred this morning, and so we're hopefully going to see those lions. I suspect they won't be doing a great deal. But Brent did say he thought one of them was possibly pregnant, so that's interesting. Let's just move slowly along the road here. We'll get another view of these water buck. Hello, Ruth. You're in Costa Rica. And a very good question about the smaller antelope, the smaller, very selective feeding antelope that we have out here. You want to know about the diker, the steenbok, and the bushbuck, and how we tell the difference between them. Ruth, once you've seen all three, you can't really confuse them, especially if you see them as often as we do. A diker, first of all, the steenbok is much smaller than both of the others. A diker sort of mid-sized, and then a bushbuck. There's this water buck here. So while we look at the water buck, I'll explain it to you. And then the, the bushbuck, a little bit bigger than that. So a bushbuck is about impala-sized, a little bit smaller, but just about impala-sized. So a big ram would weigh uh, probably about 65 kilograms or 150 pounds or so. That would be a bushbuck. A diker, big female would weigh, and she's slightly bigger than the male, would weigh in at about 17 kilograms. And if you multiply that by 2.2, prime number by 2.2, somewhere around, so much smaller, you know, sort of about 60 pounds, roughly. And then the 
Stirnbock is only about 11 kilograms and about 20, so that's about 24 pounds. Is that right? 24 pounds? Yes, and then four, sorry, let's call it 40 pounds for the die cap. So those are the three sizes, Ruth. And then the, the Stirnbock is a beautiful chestnut color, sort of very reddish brown chestnut color. The die cap, it tends to be gray, which gives a rise to its other common name, which is the gray die cap. And it's grayer the closer towards the cape you get. So it's a little bit brown around here, but certainly nowhere near the chestnut color of the Stirnbock. And then the bushbok, of course, is uh, much larger, and it's a sort of liver chestnut color, I guess, and it's got spots, uh, bits and various spots, and it's got much bigger horns. It's part of the, it looks like a small nyala, basically, a, a mini nyala. So that's the difference there. Nice question, thank you, Ruth. That's three of the antelope we get here. I figured out, or oh, I didn't figure out, I counted them, that we probably have about nine species of antelope here. So there's four with the waterbuck. There are kudu as well. There are nyala, there are impala, there are, what does that give us? That gives me seven. Brian, another two. Um, I'm missing two. Well, I suppose we'd consider the wildebeest one. And the other is going to be very obvious when I remember it. Okay, Stirnbock, Dyker, Nyala, Bushbuck, Kudu, Wildebeest, Wotterbuck, uh, 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 did I say Bushbuck? Okay, let's do it once more, last time. Stirnbok, Diker, Bushbuck, Nyala, Kudu. We did have the Sable, Waterbuck, um, Impala. There's one more, it's an obvious one. Wildebeest, there we go. Nine. Right, so we're coming out onto the Cheetah Cut Line, which is our east eastern boundary. Jaden, you're possibly a new viewer, which is wonderful, and thank you for getting hold of us. Thank you for your time, mostly, and secondly, thank you very much for your question. You want to know how do I know the difference immediately on site between a male bushbuck and a female? Well, the difference, Jaden, is actually incredibly obvious because the males all have horns, so they're very easy to notice, and the females have no horns. When they're tiny babies, it's a bit more difficult, but at the, when they're that age, when they're adults, it's very easy indeed. So, Jaden, that's how we do it. Not particularly um, impressive intellectual stamina required to get that one. Thank you for your question there. So now we're on the cheetah cut line and heading down the eastern boundary. And I like to normally sit up when we're going down here to plug myself into a different plug. There we go. I can hear you now, Jerry. You'll have to repeat what you just said to me. Now, of course, I'm not blessed with great height, so I need to sit up on the chair, or at least on the door. Now, Tony lives in Ireland, where I'm sure it's raining. There is a very good reason, of course, that the Ireland is emerald, and that is because we know grass enjoys water. See, it's not emerald here. Ireland is emerald because, well, there's lots of water there all the time. And Tony, you want to know why it is, or is it true, that predators will avoid waterbuck? So waterbuck have a gland underneath the skin. It's like a musky gland. No one's entirely sure why it's there. And sometimes people, I've heard it said, I've read it, that they will exude this kind of musky scent when they're alarmed, when they're afraid, and they'll run off and sort of leave the scent trail behind, and that puts the animals off their meat. Um, Tony, I'm not convinced that, and that predators do avoid waterbuck. I've seen a few waterbuck kills in my time. I've probably seen as many waterbuck kills as I have kudu kills, for example. And I think that predators, especially lions, will happily eat them. So will hyenas. 
I just think that they're not particularly common in some areas. They're quite common here, and I haven't seen a water buck kill here. But I don't think animals necessarily avoid them. I think maybe that, that gland is a, a one way of slightly deterring predators, but apparently, I mean, if you, for example, if you were to be hunting and you hunted a water buck for food, you'd have to skin it very quickly before the meat got tainted. But I have eaten water buck steak and it's, it's very good. So I think it's a little bit of a myth that antelope or that antelope, that predators will try and avoid water buck. Now, Brian, were you with Brent this morning? Or was that Andrew? Okay. So the lions, I believe, are around here, just around these in the trees here. I suspect if they're still here, we will find a vehicle or two. Ooh. I just heard some squealing like a baby bird. Oh, that's what it was. It was those gray helmet shrikes flying off there. Brian, the expert bird tracker, has tracked them, of course. So they were in this clearing here, and I think the water buck must have been just around here. Right. While we're knocking about here, trying to find the lions, let's go across to Scott. I don't see any vehicles here, so I'm not, going to ho I'm not holding out great hope at the moment. Let's go across to Scott. He has a much larger animal to show you. Well, I hope James does manage to work out where those lions have gone, and ideally they've come onto Juma, not further away from our boundary. But nice that we can actually leave him to focus on that as we enjoy this elephant bull who appears to be very casually grazing and browsing straight towards us. So hopefully he continues in this direction. It's often the best way to oh, just toss that branch out the way. But like I was saying, it's often one of the best ways to view a lot of the wild animals is to position yourselves in front of them and that way you're giving them the opportunity to, to decide how close they're willing to come to you rather than intruding on their space. But he is quite a long way off now, so what we may find is that we may possibly be able to do a little, little bit of off-roading in order to get closer to him, but let's just wait and see what happens. You'll notice he's flapping his ears fairly readily and that's not to so much fan his body but it's more to cool the veins and arteries that run through those ears like host pipes massive massive arteries and veins and that is the way the elephants can keep cool during the heat of the day when they are often feeding and most of the other animals are relaxing So massive ears, not so much for hearing, but for cooling. Bizarre animals, the elephants, when you think about it, like I said, massive ears, not for hearing, then that long nose, which is for smelling, but also for feeding and drinking. One of the most kind of useful noses on the planet, I think, in terms of how many different uses it can be utilized for. Notice between his eye and his ear, there's a slight little wet patch, kind of like a seep from a temporal gland that's weeping. And these are emotional indicators for elephants. So exactly what his mood is, it's hard to say, but we can expect some kind of moody behavior from him, possibly. Maybe he's in must. I did check between his legs and didn't notice any moisture between his back legs, which is often indicative of an elephant bull being in must. But just a useful indicator to keep an eye on.
as we sit here now, you'll notice that there's not too much noise. The bush is still very still and quiet. Unlike this morning, it was an incredible morning to be out. James and myself took Kirsty and Alex, the Russian tech genius, on a little walk. And the bird song and sounds were incredible. And hopefully that'll happen again. Things will warm up again this evening. You may have noticed the hood of a vehicle there. There's Ryan from Arethusa with his guests also enjoying this elephant sighting. Great, well, he's heading into an impenetrably thick area there, you can see, so let's leave him to his own devices. Two more views, no, he's heading off into even more thick stuff. We can barely see him. And let's carry on with the main goal, and that is to patrol the western boundary of Arethusa along the main riverbed system that runs through here, the Marakeni Riverbed. Good afternoon, Ryan. Go ahead. Okay, well, Ryan's trying to get a hold of me. I can't share him too clearly, and we're going to send you across to James to see if he's had any luck finding those lines. Their knees, the other one is walking and wagging her tail. What? Rubbish. Oh, my goodness. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my my um, my little plug came out, and um, I, uh, I was I was singing a silly song to the warthogs. Uh, that is so embarrassing. Uh, here we are with uh, three warthogs. Can we start that again, everybody? I'm going to pretend that we've just gone live right now. Ah, welcome everyone. We've just found a two warthog, three warthogs, two little piglets, and a sow, and they are grazing along the road on the short grass offered by what is known in South Africa as the middle maniki, which means the ma middle man, and that's the bit of vegetation in the middle of the road. Now, I've seen these chaps before in exactly the same place, just around that rock there, coming from the other side. They were immediately confiding, and that was about four weeks ago. They haven't grown an enormous amount. Brian, was I with you, or was I with someone else? Must have been with someone else. Brian doesn't remember it. Um, I think he would have, because they were tiny little pigs. And they don't see, they obviously have a termite mound burrow somewhere around here. It's obviously very leopard free in this region. And uh, at the moment, pretty lion free too. I didn't see hide nor hair of those lions. And I suspect they moved into Torchwood during the course of the morning to find some deep shade or maybe even go up to the water where they could have a small drink. Let's sneak a little bit forward. They have wonderfully uh, relaxed, these chaps. Hello, Sarah in Tucson. Um, a very nice opportunity your question has offered to just explain a bit about the Sabi Sands. You say, who makes all the roads in the Sabi Sands, or who made them all? Um, the answer is the landowners made all of the roads in the Sabi Sands, Sarah. And, of course, there are lots of different landowners here. In the, oh, this particular one is owned by a chap called Yuri Muman. And Yuri, uh, Yuri's family, I think, put these roads in many years ago. I hear a squirrel alarm calling just behind us. It's not a very angry alarm call, though. Although, we'll just keep listening while we look at the warthogs. Um, so, Sarah, it, it, the various landowners of the, of the Sabi Sands would do it themselves. There are lots and lots of different landowners in the Sabi Sands uh, of, with various sized properties. And they, some of them, like the big places like Singita and Nondalozi and Mala Mala and Lion Sands, will have an entire team of people. And in fact, I think Arethusa does as well. We'll have an entire team of people dedicated to maintaining the roads, you know, putting up the, the bumps, which are not bumps so much as they are drainage humps. And that's basically how it works. But the tracks and 
roads are, were put in, you know, have been put in variously from the time that the place was first used as, a, as farmland. Many roads are relocated as we become more aware of the geology of the area and some of the roads, even on Juma, will eventually be moved because they go across areas that are, you know, they, they're natural sinks or uh, seep lines, which isn't great. Uh, it's not great to put a road across a seep line. Beautiful little warthog. I'm amazed they've lasted this long, you know. About six weeks, I think. Yeah, probably about six weeks since I last saw them. Hello, Sir Richard on Twitter. Uh, you want to know what my song was about. You said it was a cool song. I think it was a ridiculous song. Um, it was about the warthogs. Um, I don't know where it came from. It just kind of, uh, I was singing a ridiculous song while I waited to see if Jerry wanted to link. Uh, she then spoke to me, but I was unplugged, so I didn't hear. Whoops. So I'm sorry you had to be subjected to that uh, level of silliness on a serious Saturday afternoon. You know, the drought can't be that bad if these warthogs are still doing all right. Warthogs are supposed to be the okay, first no, species have, uh, that has attention. trouble with drought. They're the guys that really seem to struggle. They can't migrate big distances to water. So the drought is obviously not particularly severe yet. Let's go a little bit forward. The squirrel has stopped shouting. Like I say, he was very non-committal about his shouting, I must say. question and it's wonderful to hear from you thank you for asking us a question you want to know do any of the animals shed I think was your query and that's probably got to do with the fact that I was talking about the thick fur on the water buck uh, Sarah I think animals don't they don't shed necessarily their coats certainly will become slightly thinner during the summer months and in winter they'll thicken up a bit but not in the same way that European or North American animals will have a notable change in fur thickness. And that's mainly because there just isn't that much variation in our seasons. So it gets quite warm here in the summer. It's very hot in the summer, obviously. But in the winter, it's really not that cold. It only drops to about 40 or well, 4 degrees Celsius, which is around about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's really not that difficult at all. Now, that's a young male, and you can see he's got a two warts on his face there, so four in all, and that's a very good distinguishing marker when they're a young warthog like this. You can tell that that's going to be a little ball. You can see where his tusks are going to erupt from. He's very sweet, isn't he? That's a wonderful shot of the bottom tusk there. Now, if you are ever set upon by a warthog, in fact, any pig, that bottom tusk is what you've got to watch out for, not the top one. The top one is not sharp, but look at the sharpness of that bottom canine there. And every time it closes, she closes her jaws, it occludes up against the top one, and then there's a razor, razor sharp edge on that tusk. Now, Mim, you're in, Cal in Canada, um, and just hang on one second. Right, and you want to know what the dewclaw-like things are, Mim, on the, just above the hooves. Um, they're actually called dewclaws, Mim, those things that Brian's showing you now, and they are, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the first and fifth digits. If I'm not mistaken, you know, all, all mammals will have five digits uh, of various kinds in, within that foot in the bone structure. I think that's number one and number five. And 
in the who's will be one of one of the who's will have two and three and the other one will have four i think i'm stand to correction there but those are just they are definitely two two of the digits two of the five mammal digits And there they go. Seems like an appropriate time to press on. Even a horse has got five digits within its one hoof. I think they're called, what do they call them? Metacarpals, Brian. They're hand bones. I think they're called the metacarpals. Or carpals or something like that. Even a bat, if you look at a bat's wings, they've got five digits. And I mean, they're, so the carpals are just extended and from them hang the membrane that forms the bat's wings. I'm always amazed and I, I love looking at um, different mammals and looking at their structure and seeing where the different, where the equivalent bone on a human being is. I just think it's so interesting that we're all put, put together if you really look at it in such an incredibly similar fashion. Now, there are two birds up there, Brian, which we might be able to get with the super zoom up in this left hand of the tall knob thorns there. Can you see there's a black one and there's a less than black one? And I wonder if they're not. Can you see what I'm looking at? There's the black one. This is, that's wonderful. It's a, it's a pair of black cuckoo shrikes. So the black one is the male. The female looks like a kind of a, she's a mottled yellow color. This is fantastic. I haven't seen a pair of these things here. I thought I heard them calling. There's the black cuckoo shrike. That's the male. It's wonderful, let me retrieve my book immediately so that I might show you a picture of what I mean. Gee whiz, that's great. There's the male, you can just hear, you might be able to hear them calling. I'll play the call for you now. That's the female. Beautiful, really, really nice. for cuckoo. There we go. No, cuckoo shrike. 318. Now, that's what we were looking at, everyone. Those two birds there. And sometimes the male will have a yellow shoulder. I didn't see the yellow shoulder on this one. So I think it was probably that one with no yellow shoulder. And that's the female there. Isn't that interesting? So normally it's the male that's more colorful, but this time round the female. That is the black cuckoo shrike. And I'll just quickly play you the call to remind myself mainly. And I wonder how many of you who keep your bird lists, how many of you got that? Right, let's go quickly. Now, Heidi, you're in Switzerland. While I try and find the cuckoo shrike on my app here, and you want to know the difference between a European and an African roller. Heidi, there's no such thing as an African roller. Um, we've got the lilac-breasted roller and the purple roller out here, and the European roller is, a, is a, another roller species. I'll show you a picture now. And they go back to Europe during the, our winter time, their summer time, and they don't breed here. I'm just going to play the sound of the black cuckoo shrike. There, oh, he's just called. There. That's the call of the black cuckoo shrike. Beautiful call. Marvelous. Good. I haven't forgotten it all entirely. Relief. Oh, he's going to call all day if I don't stop him. Shh. 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 There we go. Okay. Heidi, let me show you the rollers. Um, he's just called European, like I say, because he goes back to Europe and actually breeds in Europe. And I had some Italian guests once, and they very distressingly told me as we drove past a European roller, they say, Taste the good on the pasta. 
And I said, I said, what? He says, yes, when they come, we shoot them in the summertime. You know, it takes all sorts, I suppose. There's the European roller there. That's the one that the, some Italians like to eat on their pasta. He lives in Europe and breeds in Europe. And the other ones, there's no African roller. All of these other rollers are African species. There's a racket-tailed, which if you were very lucky, you might see here. There's the purple, which is pretty common here. And then, of course, the lilac-breasted there, which is very common here. And they live here permanently. So, Heidi, I hope that answers your question. There are a number of birds that are called African or European, depending on where they migrate and where they breed. Right. Just, sorry, one more look at the black cuckoo shrike. He's, can you see him there, Brian? He's come right out into the open. There he is. And there's his lady behind him. Oh, as he flies. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. And Gerda, I was hoping somebody would send through an update about this not being on their list yet. You say this is number 134 for your list. That's fantastic. Great stuff. Beautiful black cuckoo shrike sighting. Well done, everyone. Let's carry on, see what else we can see along this road. So like I say, um, no lions where we looked. Right, very, now, while we're on the subject of sort of ornithology and driving along looking at a yellow bird, um, it's exactly the kind of thought I had. Tim, you're in Arkansas and you want to know where are the yellow weavers? Why haven't we been seeing them? The um, southern mask weaver, the lesser mask weaver, the village weaver. I think it's a, purely the lack of water. They tend to like to nest near water or over water. And I think what you'll find is that because there's no water in any of the uh, watering holes, they're just simply not nesting this year. And I haven't even seen them flying around. So I wonder if the males haven't kind of lost their winter plu or their summer plumage already and pressed on and they're just kind of not going to breed this year. But that's why we haven't seen a lot of them, Tim. Good question. a lot of luck on this road at various times with um, quarantine and Gunuma. Both of them seem to quite like this area. So let's hold thumbs. And those two who I meant, just mentioned, for those of you who are new viewers, and I know there are a few of you, uh, they are two young male leopards. Oh, we don't often see these things. Have you got in there? We hear them. Oh, he's right. There he is. Beautiful brown hooded kingfisher. Oh, that's nice. That's wonderful. So, like I say, common, but we seldom see them like that. And they make a lovely call. They make a call that goes. Pity for you! Pity for you! That is the brown hooded kingfisher. <clears throat> uh -huh. Oh, I'm missing you again. Sorry, Jerry, I keep losing, losing comms. I'm flitting about in my seat a bit much. Go again, Jerry, I'm listening now. All right, let's head across to Scott Dyson. He's on Arethusa, terra incognito to the west, and I'll see you shortly. Hello, and welcome back to the search for the Anderson male leopard. So far, no sign of him. I've just spent a short time on foot walking in some riverbed where I've actually seen him before I saw him for the first time and leopards will use pathways 
areas or kind of set areas that they're more inclined to move through as they check their territorial boundaries. And that is one area that I'm fairly certain he moves through because the last time I was there, just checking that area because I know he's been there before, we found tracks of his moving through that area. So, sadly, no luck this time, but he could be anywhere around us now. And the beauty of searching the boundaries, the kind of buffer zones between leopards' territories, is that you could bump into either him or Tingana, the other dominant male whose buffer is here, or both, ideally having a bit of a debate over land. And happy that we could give you a brief update, but it appears that James is finding all the animals, so we're going to send you straight back to him with a very pretty bird of prey. Is that not just the most beautiful sight, everybody? A pair of Batelier eagles. Misses on the right, if I'm not mistaken. I think I am mistaken, actually. I can never remember this. Stand by one second, I'll just consult my book. Oh. Yeah, no, I was correct. It is... No, oh, no. Hang on, wait. Wait, 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 wait. What we're looking for, everybody, is a kind of... The male is black-winged on the tip of his wings, and the female has got more colour. So that is, that is the female on the right. The male with the white shoulders. Isn't that stunning? I think that they are the most beautiful raptor that we get here. They um, are monogamous. I'm not sure if they're made for light. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people do kind of mistake monogamy for um, for mating for life. We, try, we tend to like to think of birds and animals as mating for life because it makes us feel like they are noble. But they're certainly a monogamous pair. And it's interesting, you know, they don't breed all year round, obviously. They have a, a chick every so often. But they remain together. And it's difficult to understand the evolutionary reason behind that. They don't hunt like an African hawk eagle pair, where you know where they will hunt in tandem, like a tiny air force. They scavenge, and yet they seem to find some advantage in staying with each other, which I think is quite well on a purely anthropomorphic, from a purely anthropomorphic perspective, it's quite sweet. From a biological perspective, I'm not really sure what the advantage is. So any ideas as to why these birds, if they're not breeding, should stay together, I'd be fascinated to know what you wanted to know. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Valerie on Twitter. Apparently you are a raptor freak. I'm not sure I know what a raptor freak is, Valerie. I'm assuming that you just love raptors. Uh, yes, I think that they're fantastic as well. And Valerie, you would have been interested in the little walk that we did this morning. Scott and... Alex and I and uh, Kirsty went out and we just had a brief walk for about an hour and a half this morning. We found what looked to be the nest of, I think, a lizard buzzard. So it looked like a minute, like that Wilberg's nest that we see, but a miniature one. And I think that's what it was. There was no bird in it, but I was fascinated. I've never seen a small raptor's nest like that. You can see she's a little bit hot. She's just opened her beak so that she can flap her gular pouch, and that helps. It's just like panting in dogs. There's a pouch at the back of the throat that has sort of moist membranes on it, and it's thickly, it's got thick blood vessels there, and so the heat from that blood will be cooled just before it goes to the brain. And 
Sarah, an interesting question. You're in Tucson and you want to know if they're getting ready to mate now. Um, Sarah, I don't think they are. I think you will find that if they were going to mate, they would have already. Um, they've certainly mated before. I've seen a juvenile around them, but not a very new one. So I haven't seen a fledgling. So what I'm going to do is just check on this remarkable bird app that I have. This will tell me precisely when their breeding season is. Not Barbet Batalia. There we go. Breeding a monogamous stick platform. Yes, we know that. Let's just quickly go look. They've got a summary at the beginning of the thing, and then they've got an enormous description of the bird, and you need to be able to speed read. Here we go. Pair bond. Oh, listen. Listen. Sarah, I might be entirely wrong. Isn't that wonderful? Right, so we just, we've turned the audio up. Just in case she calls again or he calls again, it'd be nice to hear him. So I'm just going to talk quietly like this and tell you that in South Africa, 77% of them will breed between January and March. So Sarah, absolutely, that's precisely what seems to be going on here. He's singing her a little love song. And perhaps I know there's a nest around here. I know there is a nest around here somewhere. And so perhaps it's going to have new eggies in it fairly soon. And I suspect, much like with the predatory or carnivorous mammals, a drought like this is probably not bad for them, especially as they're scavengers. So it might be a good year for them to breed. What a brilliant ob observation. Well done, Sarah. <laughs> a, a question from M in London. Um, M, I'm surprised that MI6 allows you to use the bandwidth for this sort of thing, but um, I'm very pleased that they do. Uh, you missed the name of this bird. Uh, this bird is called a batelier. Beautiful raptor called a batelier. Ryan, is that thunder? Sound like it. it does sound like thunder. It's exciting. Now, Lisa, brilliant, also lovely um, sort of observation, ornithological observation. You say, do we get barn house owls here because you know... Oh, look, 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 oh, my goodness. I don't know what's going on here. Lisa, I will get back to your question. We do get barn house here, absolutely. Maybe things are not quite so monogamous after all, Brian. So we've got two males and one female there. Unfortunately, my binoculars, which were last used by Hannibal the Carthaginian as he came over the Alps on his elephant, can't really tell me what's going on there. I, they look like fully grown adults to me, so I'm fascinated by this. I don't know, there must be some competition. But they are monogamous, as I said. <laughs> that poor chap on the right, he looks to have been replaced. Look, he's, he seems to be looking at his feet, very embarrassed now. You know, while we watch what unfolds here, um, Yes, barn owls absolutely are found on this continent and they make the same call, that screeching call that they make just about everywhere else in the world. Interesting that they should be distributed so widely.
Now, apparently, in order to seduce a female, they will, the males will do a sort of a, a aerial display, and she will normally fly with them. Now, that would be quite something to see, as opposed to this kind of awkward silence that has ensued. Two of them were having a very nice date at one stage, and now three is a bit of a crowd, really. I think this is the most stunning sighting. Mm. Brian, I know you're desperately wondering what you should get me for my 40th birthday when it occurs later this year. Maybe a pair of binoculars, yeah. <laughs> I had Adrian on Twitter, a lovely question. I love answering this question because it's, people are normally so surprised by it. You want to know how old bataliers can live to? Up to 30 years, Adrian, can you believe that? Can you believe that a bird can live to 30 years? I think it's amazing. Well, I know that some of the parrots can, some of them up to 40, but this thing apparently lives up to about 30 years. Which I think is astonishing. Beautiful. You see, Lisa, this is what I thought as well, but then I, I realized that was a, it wasn't a particularly intelligent thought from my part. Um, and a very good question, could one of them be a chick from a previous uh, sort of um, previous breeding? Lisa, it's possible, but remember that they take seven years to get to that adult plumage, which means that those birds are all over seven years old. And for a fully grown adult like that to be with its parents, I think is extremely unusual. And I've seen a pair here with a juvenile, or certainly with a sub-adult, and I don't think that that, I mean, unless he's had a very fast molt in the last little while, and he's still hanging around home. Maybe he's just like a modern human being, doesn't know when to get out. That's quite possible. It's possible. But Lisa, I think it's unlikely. All right. Right, the great, f from the two, three great flying birds to the Arethusa International Airstrip with Scott, I will stay here for the next little while and see you shortly. So here we are at the Arethusa International Airstrip. The two Impala Rams that you can see are busy walking down the airstrip. And tranquil scenes here. Well, I think I can possibly hear some thunder rumbling off to the south and west. Oh, and maybe the Impala heard it too, and that's why they're jumping for joy, because as you can see, it is extra, extra dry here, and the animals, especially the herbivores, are needing help with regards to moisture. If we look out to the, to the south here, you can see a bit of dark clouds. I mean, it's nothing too serious yet, but I think that hopefully could build into something more serious as the afternoon unfolds. I thought I did hear some thunder on Andrew, did you hear that or am I yeah, imagining things? I think I did also. So that'll be great. So here's a little, look at that interesting structure, a little kind of lookout deck. Never been up there. Um, maybe I should do that one day. A few tables and chairs, very civilized. The air traffic control tower. The step over here is broken, so if you do go up, watch out. Okay, you see Andrew's been up there, he knows that the steps are a bit wobbly. Thank you. And 
There's this little water hole here, but it doesn't look like anybody's on their way for a drink. I'm sure it's been getting a lot of attention through the course of the day, but nobody appears to be interested in coming across now. So we're going to continue. There are some warthogs that I have seen not too far away. Let's see if we can't get you some views of them. I'm sure a lot of you, especially the new viewers who may have only seen a batalier for the first time, are happy that James found them. Incredible birds of prey, and not one, not two, but three. And I'm almost certain that he was on Ledwood Road in order to get to that site, and we've become familiar with those batalier that hang around in the kind of southeastern corner of Juma. And again, we're just so fortunate to get to know this area and the animals that live in it to the degree that we have. I haven't got to know this family of warthogs though, so it's going to be nice to spend some time with them. It looks like two different mothers here with their individual sets of piglets that are all the very similar size and age. So I'm not sure which ones belong to to who, but it's usually four piglets per female, not many more than that. So the fact that there's five indicates to me that these are both mothers. You can also see that they both have clearly have nursing nipples, and they are collectively raising the piglets. More eyes and ears make for a safer environment, certainly. Adrian, you would like to know how long these creatures will survive for out here. And if they survive till adulthood, I would say anywhere up to around 10 years of age would be a ripe old age for a water. Look at how cute the piglets are when they go running, tails up in the air. An automatic trigger mechanism that warthogs have. As soon as they start running, that tail pops up vertically. So yeah, Adrian, I'd guess about 10 years, but I don't actually know the exact lifespan. Obviously, I mean, in the African wilds, a lot of animals' lives get cut short by predators. But like I say, I think 10 years would be uh, my guess as to their average age. But I'm happy for you guys to double check me on that. I could well be wrong. You often find warthogs on in and around airstrips in safari areas in Africa. And the reason why they like these areas is because it's safe for them. They also like snacking on short grass. So the fact that they can see far, their foods are here, means that you often find them. It often makes pilots' lives a bit tricky because you often have to buzz the airstrip, chase all the, the game off it before you land just to make sure you don't have any accidents and warthogs are often the main culprits being chased off the airstrips just like earlier with that big bull that we saw or boar rather you can see these youngsters going down onto their elbows to feed oh rocky night you read my mind you've just asked for us to please find you a cheetah and I could think of nothing better than seeing a cheetah here somewhere as you can see Andrew is trying to help check the likely spots up in and around termite mounds but it's been quite some time since we've had reports of cheetah in this area rocky nights oh there goes some Senegal lapwing that you can hear calling Kudu, kudu. <laughs> oh, two more. Wonderbar. Well then, Mr. Andrew. Good. As I was saying there, Rocky Knight, not many cheetah in this general area. And when they are around, uh, they are tricky to track down. Having said that, though, it wasn't too far away from here that I actually did see a cheetah finishing off a dike here, one of the few cheetah sightings we've had in over the year that I've been here on Safari Live. I think we've probably only seen them 
five or six times collectively amongst all the presenters. And the reason why, for those of you who are new, is because we get such good line and leopard sightings that it means they kind of outweigh the cheetah in populations. And cheetahs are not nearly as big and strong as lion and therefore will be killed by both lion and leopard. So a strong competition between those big cats. And hopefully one day we will be doing some live safaris in another part of Africa where there are more cheetah and different animals for us to get to know because it's one animal that I've hardly spent time with out of all my years in the bush. I've got to know a lot of the African animals very well. But the cheetah is one that I haven't. And that's simply because I've never really worked in cheetah-rich areas or cheetah-dense areas. And being the fastest mammal on the planet, obviously they provide for incredibly good entertainment when they are hunting. And I've been, have been lucky enough to see them successfully hunt and kill on two occasions and their speed is just absolutely frightening. The first time was actually in an open area like this and we were following the cheetah and we could see the impala far up ahead, like two or three hundred meters up ahead. And what happened was is that we, oh, what's that? Is that a stand buck there? Yeah, it's just a stand buck away on the other side. They all spotted Andrew. There's a little antelope feeling there, fully grown but miniature. As I was saying though, the cheetah we were following and it was heading straight to these impala which were about 200 or 300 meters away from us and when the impala were about 50 or 60 meters away the cheetah started kind of trotting towards them so no longer stalking like it knew it was going to be seen and the impala saw it and started running and they had a 50 or 60 meter head start I mean that is a massive head start considering lion and leopard will usually only spring out when they're about 5 to 10 meters away from their prey and I thought, oh well, you know, that's that. No way is the cheetah is going to succeed. And then the cheetah put the hammer down and started moving at speeds up to it's kind of 60 miles an hour, even upwards of that. And it made the impala look like they had fridges strapped to their backs. They were basically hardly even moving. And the cheetah gained up with them so quickly, they disappeared over a slight ridge while the chase was unfolding. And as we caught up to all the action, all we could see was the impala kicking on the ground with the cheetah busy suffocating it. So they really surprised me by their speed. We're going to send you back to James, who's still with the battalion. Toodle-doo. Hello, everybody. Apparently, Tony, you sent through a picture of all three, and you reckon that the one on the right there's got slightly more brown on his wings, and therefore could be slightly younger, perhaps. He's definitely not a juvenile. Um, he's definitely at least six or seven years old, so I wouldn't definitely wouldn't call him a juvenile. He may be slightly younger than the other one, and he might be related. It's it's well possible. I don't know, but they have not moved since I, you were last here with us, so I'm afraid I think we're going to press on from here. Brent is just going, uh, he's tracking this afternoon, and he's just gone around to check where he had the lions this morning, uh, hoping that perhaps they are still there. Um, given that I drove past and didn't see them. Um, I don't think I'm that blind, but it is not impossible. Oh dear. Brian? Um, right, we'll be staying here. Does it work? Yeah, it does work. But it isn't for the click. It's all good, huh? <laughs> all right, we're going to get back to Scott quickly, and then we'll start the car, and I'll keep you posted. Glad we got another glimpse of the battalions. And let's hope James manages to get the old rust bucket ticking over again. I'm sure he will. It just requires a little bit of tweaking and trying, but we haven't got to the bottom of what's wrong, wrong with that immobilizer. Excuse me, immobilizer. I'm feeling confident.
front front being to get rain. I can can taste it in there, and it's coming from down in that direction where you can see all that dark coloration. So hopefully we're going to get a massive downpour tonight. It'll be great for the environment, but it'll also be great for us because it's wonderful exploring the bush after there's been a good rainpour. Lots of frogs and different animals come out and the bush becomes alive, which it typically should be every day in summer, but because of the dark, we're not really getting the usual summer joy. to know if we ever see secretary birds in and around that airstrip and yes Valerie exactly that is the one place that they get seen more often than anywhere else that I've heard of in our area of Traverse and a few of the Arethusa guys have had some wonderful sighting of secretary birds hunting there and for those of you who don't know what a secretary bird is it's a bizarre bizarre bird of prey and I'll get out in the book for you quickly and it's got really long legs, it specializes in hunting um, snakes, amongst other things. And what it does is it strikes down with its foot in order to kill its prey. Here we go here. And they stand over a meter off the ground, so they're like 1.2, 1 1.3 meters in height. And long legs, they're called secretary birds because they've got these funny little feathers that stick out of their head similar to the secretary with her head full of pencils or pens. I guess that was something that secretaries did back in the day when they named this bird. I've never seen a secretary with, with pens and pencils sticking out of their head, but that's how it got its name. So yeah, I don't know, have you seen, we've seen a couple on, on, on the live drives, but not many. Again, that's not to say that around the next corner there isn't going to be one hammering a puff at it to death. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Obviously more wonderful for us than for the puff adder, but that is the way of life out here. There is a food chain and in order for certain animals to survive, others need to be consumed. And it's something that we seldom get to see, so I often get quite excited by the prospects of seeing it happening simply because it's a rarity. to Ray in Idaho and I'm so happy to hear that you have got a trip planned to the Sabi Sands coming up soon to a camp called the Nyati. Look at how pretty this lilac breasted roller is and it's just turned around especially for you Ray and everyone else. It looks like a youngster to me. Its tail lacks the streamers that the adults have so this one could well have been born and hatched this year or late last year. All right, you say you're going to Inyati, it's in the southern Sabi Sands, it's a beautiful camp, I know it well, on the Sand River, with beautiful green rolling lawns, where hippo often graze every night, and Ray, you will not be seeing animals that we see here, none of the lions that we see, you'll see there, I mean, you may see the Salala breakaways, but unlikely, you'll see none of the leopard, um, possibly the Anderson male, very, very vague chance you may see him. But no, none of the leopards or lions that we get in this area of the Sabi Sands will go into what is called the western section of the Sabi Sands, which is the area that you're going to. But what I can assure you is that you are going to get spoilt. It's a very productive area. There's quite a few vehicles that traverse that western section. So what that means is that there's a lot of animals that are often located. So... I'm sure you're going to have a great time with lots of sightings there. And what I do know is that there's a female leopard there called Tlanganisa, 
who's got three little cubs at the moment. They're probably, I'm guessing, about two months old, just judging from the size of them in the videos that I've been watching. So if those three are still alive when you get here, you're going to be in for a treat. So that's something to look forward to. There's also uh, the Majinga Line Coalition of Lions, which uh, move through that area. So they're uh, getting quite old now. It's reaching towards the end of their reign. But sadly, no, you'll see none of the, the, the characters that you know of from our safaris. As far as game goes and general animals that we see here, yes, you'll certainly see them. That's it's not far away at all. I mean, if we started walking now, we could be at a Nyasi camp probably by, by sunset, a brisk walk. So it's not far away at all. Um, but the animals that we see here don't travel that far in terms of the lions and the leopards. But the general game, certainly, there won't be any differences the difference is you'll get to see a large river flowing through. I'm not sure how high the sand river is at the moment, but beautiful scenery along a large river that flows through this reserve that we obviously don't get to show you. So that'll be a very, very welcome change of scenery that, like I said, that'll be something that you'll notice is very different. There's also quite a few uh, little mountains and rocky outcrops in and around in Yati. But if I get to a high point, Ray, I'll even be able to show you those little the outcrops where there's a camp called Ulusaba, which is very close to Inyati. Hello to Zuni Mike in Michigan. To know if the rainfall in the surrounding areas won't fill up the rivers that flow into the Sabi Sands. And yes, they certainly will. Um, the Drakensberg mountain range is only about 30 miles away, roughly. Um, and it's a massive catchment area uh, that feeds into the rivers. And these rivers do flow through community land, rural land, before coming into the reserve. So that means a couple of things. Even though there's a large catchment area, that would have many years ago filled up the streams without any humans intercepting that water between there and here. That now has changed. There are many farms and many people that will intercept, like I say, that water before it gets to us. So even though, yes, there are mountains that will feed the rivers that flow here, um, there's various factors that affect that f flow of water. And What's interesting, Mike, is that you can get caught out and guides who have to cross the, the Sand River or who have the opportunity to cross the Sand River may cross the river in the early afternoon and there may not be a drop of rain anywhere around us, but because of rain that's fallen far away, that river can rise drastically and it's kind of flash flood and you can get stuck on the other side of the river. Um, a friend of mine that very thing happened to him with the brand new Land Rover that he drowned and along with nearly drowning his guests who were terrified obviously for their lives as their vehicle got stuck in this middle of this rising river. Thankfully we had a massive firefighting vehicle called the Buffalo. It was a Unimog basically that could go into the river and pull the Land Rover out a problem that the guides actually face. They come across beautiful sunny afternoon, they get back to the river and it's rising drastically from rain in the catchment area. But obviously because we haven't been down there or don't have access to the sand river, I don't have an idea of how heavily it's flowing. Obviously I know that it's a drought so I'm guessing it's not going to be flowing as it normally would in summer. I haven't actually seen any footage of it. So 
my plan for the last hour is possibly to do a few laps around where Karula's den site is in the hope that we may either catch a glimpse of her heading back to the den, moving out of the den, or jackpot prize will be to see her carrying one of those tiny little fluff balls in her mouth to another den site. It is a possibility. It could happen anywhere whilst driving around on Juma. We could come around the corner and see her there. So that's something that I'm wishfully thinking about. Failing that, we might find some tracks that are leaving that general area and be able to track her to where she's currently feeding on a kill, for example. So it's not a complete waste of time spending some time circling the block. So there's basically three roads that we can drive, and in the middle of that is where her den is. to Gracie and yes you can play in that tree house I know Andrew and Brent often spend time playing up there and Gracie next time I go across to Arethusa I'll make sure to go up there and tell you what it's like like I said I've never actually been up there myself but next time I go I'll take up or maybe we'll be able to take the bushwalk equipment there and that way I'll be able to take all of you up there and see what the view is like that's not I think some of you may have actually been up But Gracie, good idea. I think we should go and maybe have a cup of tea up there, have a tea party and play. And maybe wait and see what animals come to drink at that little water hole below. Exactly, and Jerry's just made a great suggestion and maybe James will be able to bring safari ken along that he made for you for the tea party Karuna, where are you hiding come on I believe Scott was shaking about a bit. Um, you know, that's what Scott does, he shakes about. I'm not sure what that means, actually. Uh, so let's forget it. Um, <laughs> we're driving along the Cheetah Cut line. Uh, we did, Brent went to where he saw the lion before. He saw one ear sticking up at about 100 meters. So we figured even with the tap zoom that we have on this camera, uh, unless we had a space, a sort of Hubble Space Telescope sized lens, there wasn't going to be any point in hanging about. So we've come straight up here to see what else there is. I haven't found any tracks or anything, but what I have seen, and I'm going to just whip perpendicular for you, is an amazing cloud coming up which is brilliant news. That looks, to me, like it could be a storm. So I think it was thunder that we heard earlier. So you could... It's incredible how my mood, and I mean, I said nothing to Brian, but his mood also seems to have uh, gone up immediately as we spotted this amazing gray cloud coming over. The sky is blue in front of the cloud. There's obviously lots of moisture there. The light is being diffused. It's just suddenly turned from a washed out, fairly sort of bland, droughty afternoon to one that is very spectacular indeed. Magnificent. Anyway, I'm feeling quite buoyed with life. Hello, Adrian. You are a new viewer. 
and you want to know if it is Saturday or Sunday here. Adrian, I'm going to ask you, before I tell you that, I'm going to ask you where in the world you are from. Tell us quickly where you're from, and then I'm going to tell you whether it's Saturday or Sunday. It doesn't actually make a difference, but I'm just interested to know where you are in the world. I will answer your question. So quickly, hashtag Safari Live us again and tell us where in the world you're watching from. And that goes for everybody. Please, please tell us where you're from when you talk to us. It's so fascinating to know whereabouts in the world you are. We've got Mr. and Mrs. Moustache in Iceland at the moment, regularly talking to us. Uh, Mrs. Moustache was very kind. She told us the other day that she doesn't, in fact, have large amounts of facial hair, which I'm sure is a relief to her and indeed to Mr. Moustache himself. Our plan at the moment is to just check the cut line here and then head down towards Biffleshook Dam and see what's going on there. And I want to park on the wall there and see what the sky looks like. I wonder if we won't perhaps see Mvula doing the same thing. update there from Simone or Simon, depending on your bent. Um, you say that the oldest recorded bird in the wild is an albatross. I didn't know that at all. Thank you very much for it. Um, do you know how old it was, Simon? Maybe you could tell us that. I'd love to know how old that bird was, the albatross. Right, we're now at the far northeastern corner of Juma, possibly the highest point. Now, Adrian, you're in Georgia. You be in Georgia. And so, Georgia, obviously, it is Saturday morning. It is Saturday afternoon here, Adrian. In Georgia, you're probably running, if I'm not mistaken, mm, are you on Central Time? I think you're probably on, what do they call it, Central Standard Time or something like that in the States, which would put you, your Eastern Time is six hours behind us. So you're probably about seven hours behind us now. And so while it is pushing six o'clock here, it is probably nine o'clock in the morning there. Is that right, Brian? Yes, makes sense. No, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. 11, it's 1800 hours here. It's 11, probably 11 o'clock in the morning there. How's that, Adrian? Still Saturday, we're seven hours in front of you. Uh, now there's suddenly this kind of air of expectation around the afternoon that we see this cloud coming up. It's incredible, the energy of the, how it changes. Let's go down here. <laughs> Hello, Julianne. <laughs> Very nice question. Does it only ever rain here at night? Julianne, it apparently never rains here at all. Um, I will forgive you for thinking that because of course it doesn't seem to rain much when we're on drive. It just hasn't rained at all this year, Julianne. We have had, I think we've lost, what, maybe four drives, Brian, maybe four drives to rain this year. Normally, Julianne, the big storms would come during the evening. So round about now is when they'd start and then they'd dissipate by the time sort of seven or eight o'clock came around. And if it's a big storm, I mean, it doesn't rain here hard for often for longer than an hour. So they really are short, sharp storms. But the reason, one of the reasons, I mean, you're obviously not watching every single hour of every show, but, yeah, I mean, even a random selection of our shows will indicate to you that it never rains here. Sorry, excuse me, a bit of air Ooh, coming up out of my stomach, which I had to let go in a genteel fashion, as opposed to belching like a buffalo on screen, which would just be deeply unattractive, wouldn't it, Brian? Yeah. Oh, dear. 
And a comment from Emily Wallington on Twitter. Emily is in Johannesburg. Hello, Emily. How very nice to hear from you. Um, I'm glad that I haven't said anything untoward on the drive so far. Uh, welcome back from America. And you say there's a big storm in Johannesburg at the moment. I love a Johannesburg storm. I obviously grew up in Johannesburg and they have the most wonderful th storms there, everyone. It gets very dark very quickly, exploding thunder all over the place, lightning flashing. I just find it the most exciting thing. And that's why when a storm starts to build here, I get all very jittery and excited. Watch out for that storm, Emily. There can also be lots of hail in Johannesburg. Now this, believe it or not, is a symptom of drought as well. Here we have a black monkey thorn acacia, Acacia burkei, and the black monkey thorn, of course, is a tree that is eaten by elephants, but elephants would normally be grazing at this time of the year. They wouldn't be pushing trees over. But if you look around the base of that black monkey thorn, you can see that it is just, you know, there's nothing there. There's no grass at all on the ground. And so the elephants are still eating trees as they would be in the dead of the winter time. And so the trees are taking a bit of a hammering. Now, this is not a negative thing, I don't believe. It is entirely in keeping with the natural order of things. This area, the whole of this continent of ours, has, is, it's evolved, it's developed through cycles of extreme drought and extreme flood. So it's not unusual, it's perfectly normal. Uh, you might even find that this tree survives. But I, we tend to think that things should be at some kind of equilibrium when we look at an area like this. So if it floods, we think, oh, it's flooding too much. If, it, if there's a huge drought, we think, oh, it's too dry. There's no too dry and too wet, especially in a place like this. And it's totally normal for Africa to ex experience these huge dips in climate. And there's a wonderful book called Africa, Biography of a Continent by a British chap called John Reader. And it's, I mean, it's an incredible tome of work, but he just describes how that kind of cycle of drought and flood has so affected the way African societies have developed and learned to cope in extreme environments. question. You've been watching Pete's Pond, which is in Mashatu in Botswana, and you say you guesstimate roughly 350 miles away in kilometers. That would put us at about 550k. Yeah, it's probably about right, Laura. I'd say that's probably about right. And you say that there isn't a drought there at the moment. I think you'll find it's probably not nearly as, as extreme as it is here. I think they have had later rain than they would have expected normally, and it will be slightly down on what it is normally. But that said, it's probably, you know, they're probably round about normal rainfall. It's also a much drier area. Mashatu, that part of Botswana, is basically on the very tip of the Kalahari Desert. And so where we get about 550 to 600 millimeters of rain in a normal year, so at Mashatu, I suspect, you'll be getting probably no more than 300 to 350. So, yes, it, and it won't, so it won't look nearly as affected by a lack of rain as this area will. Very nice. Thank you, Laura. Right, so that's Biffleshook Dam. And Laura, your second question then is how far does this drought extend? Well, over the course of what has been a very uh, miserly rainy season, I don't think it's hanging around here, Brian. There's not a great deal to see. Ooh, ooh, what is that bird? That is a lurry. There is a grey go-away bird there in the middle of Biffle's Hook Dam, not a place that a grey go where bird is normally allowed to be. Can you see it there? There, there it is. There we go. There we go. Let's double tap him. Now, Laura, you want to know you know how far does the drought extend? It's actually extended to most of the country this year. The farming areas, the breadbasket of South Africa and the Free State on the High Felt has been devastated by a drought. And the growth season has finished. So although they're here, he's right here. 
So although we are getting a little bit of rain now, sorry, he's just behind those leaves, everyone. I don't want to move the car in case he flies away. I'm going to have to. Let's just go a little bit forward. So, Laura, it's devastated the, the free state, the breadbasket part of the country, and it means that we're going to have to import quite a lot of maize and wheat this year. Although they have received some rain now. There he is. That's the bird that we're looking at, the grey go-away bird. Just don't go away, please, bird. There we go. Isn't he lovely? That's fantastic. So, Laura, and then where my folks are on the Eastern Cape, it hasn't been too bad. The Cape province, or the Western Cape, well, it's always dry this time of year. I think they had a fairly dry winter too, though, this year. So it really has been countrywide. And I think we'll find probably dissipated slowly up towards Central Africa, but most of Southern Africa has experienced a definitely well below average rainfall year, and that's because of El Nino. I like the way I said that, Brian. El Nino. And there we go. <laughs> That's what I was hoping for. Because of El Nino, which is a totally, to me, unfathomable weather pattern that comes through every so often. Wonderfully insightful question. Thank you for that, Laura. And I hope I've given it a satisfactory answer. Isn't that a magnificent little bird? He's quite a big bird, actually. He's about the size of a an African grey parrot, if you've ever seen one. Or a small chicken. My mother did a birding course once when I was at school, and oh, it was at a stage when I was disinterested in all things to do with nature. I had just discovered that, uh, well, I just discovered girls, really. And one of the things that they were taught in her birding school was that you, the first thing you do when you see a bird is to decide, is it the size of a sparrow, a, a chicken, or a crow? Not sure why the chicken was thrown in there, and that would be about chicken-sized, I suppose. See the golden light just coming out of the west now? It's just, it makes such a difference when it's dissipated by some moisture and cloud in the sky. Stunning. Another bird list, Mary in Michigan. You say you've got 168 birds on your list at the moment, and you got a new one today. I suspect quite strongly that was the black cuckoo shrike. All right, let's leave the grey go-away bird. He has much more colourful cousins that live down um, sort of south of here on the rivers. Anywhere where there's permanent water, you get beautiful uh, what we call luris or taracos. Taracos, toraco, toracos. I will just find you a picture of one. You'd think after 10 years of using this book, I would not need to consult the index anymore. Unfortunately, such is the way that my mind was designed. Right. Isn't that stunning, everyone? Right, there are the taracos or luris. And that's the grey go-away bird, the least Im sort of impressive, I don't want to say impressive, but least a colourful member of the Taraco family. And then the other one we get in this area is this fellow here, and that's the purple crested luri. And above him, the lovely Neisner luri, which lives around the Eastern Cape where my folks live, and they are just the most beautiful birds. Marvellous. Thank you. Okay, let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. Apparently he has an update on the mother, and let's find out about that. I don't think he's with her, but with any luck he is. I don't know. See you just now. So we are sitting here hoping that some Franklins that left their little area of cover behind us in a state of distress, letting out their alarm call, as they flew off, we're hoping that they have been disturbed by Karula, the mother, who, interestingly enough, the first time we followed her back to her den site, which is, and then also the grey go-away bird that James has been showing you guys now, thereafter, came from somewhere in that direction. So if 
we are lucky she's going to be moving back towards the, the den. The reason why I think she's hopefully moving back towards the den is that, that I actually had some tracks of hers in the same riverbed, but further downstream. We're currently driving upstream, about half a mile downstream. We had a bit, some of her tracks heading away from the den, and she also had deposited a dropping along the riverbed. And I got out to a close look at that dropping. It was rock solid, so it had been dried by the, the sun today. So it's probably from early last night or sometime early, early this morning that she moved down there. Now she could be making her way back to nurse the cubs. All speculation, but at least we have had some sign of which, what is an all likelihood her. She's the only female left that will be moving through this area unless, of course, there's an unexpected visitor, which does happen, of course, from time to time. much to Cecilia for your kind words, noting that we try wherever possible to give the animals as much respect and as much space as is feasibly possible. And we do really appreciate those kind words. We all are hugely in love with the bush and that's why we work here. It's certainly not for the money. Um, so our love for the animals is kind of paramount, and then the job falls in. This is the little tributary that she headed straight up, and it's further up this tributary that the den site is not far, only about 200 meters. Um, but yes, our, the majority of us work in, in the bush because we love nature, and that's what brings us here, so that's the fundamental reason why all of us, or most of us, are actually here. And I guess the job is just a way to keep ourselves alive in this day and age where you obviously need money to survive. You would like to know if the Kruger Park is a transfrontier park which opens to other countries. Yes, it certainly is. It opens to Mozambique as well as Zimbabwe in the northeastern corner of the reserve. The whole boundary, Ubawala, of the Kruger National Park. Let me get out the map here quickly. So this whole eastern boundary is open to Mozambique. Right in this northern corner, uh, kind of the Mozambican boundary will continue, will, will kind of go out like that, and Zimbabwe will start in the north. So there's a small portion of the reserve at the top here that does open into Zimbabwe, but the majority opens east, all into Mozambique. And this fence is dilapidated. I mean, here's a border post, Giriondo border post, so that's your way to cross through the park into uh, the Mozambican section. But this fence is dilapidated. I worked in an area over here in Wanetsi, and we are currently kind of in this area over here where my finger is covering. And so not far north of us uh, and to the east is Nwanetsi concession where I used to work in the past, a beautiful concession. And this fence is dilapidated. I mean, it's hardly a fence. It opens into rural bush um, in Mozambique, but the animals move basically at will through that dilapidated fence into Mozambique. So even though there is a fence, it's hardly functional, nothing like the, the western fence of the Kruger National Park, where there's a lot more humans and developments, and therefore this fence needs to be fully electrified, keeping animals away from humans. Here, you get kind of people living as they did many, many years ago off the land, um, and that's why I guess they are kind of at one with the animals. But it also gives you an idea of how the rest of the Africa is so suited and or, or not suited, how the rest of Africa is currently, and that is that a lot of wildlife destinations in Africa are unfenced, and animals can roam wherever they want. And there are good aspects to that, but there's also negative aspects to that. For me, the, the best scenario is for animals and humans to be kept away from one another, unless, of course, it's people who are trained and know what they're doing in the bush, taking people around. 
yeah, something interesting to think about, that many, many parts of Africa are unfenced and animals can roam and therefore cause trouble with people and their crops and not be protected, but that is the continent that we live on and the realities behind it. Karula's den is literally 20 meters down to our left here somewhere. It's just in here somewhere. I'm not too sure. I think it's a little bit behind us there now. Yeah, it's just behind us where we've driven past. In the steep bank, kind of overhang in the steep bank in this riverbed. Even though we can drive quite close to where the den is along this road, we can't see into it from there and we don't want to do anything abnormal. Obviously driving along this road is going to be fine. But we don't want to start poking our noses in there just yet. It's too soon. You would like to know if I did not live in South Africa, where in the world would I consider living? And um, probably up in Kenya or Tanzania, uh, wonderful, wonderful countries where I've spent quite a lot of time. I spent the two years prior to starting uh, on Safari Live, um, I spent two years up in Tanzania and Kenya. And yeah, I, I love the less developed countries like Kenya and Tanzania. South Africa is far more developed than most other African countries. So we are first world, you could say, in relation to a lot of the other African countries. And of course, there are benefits to that. But I love raw, real Africa with untouched wilderness areas with our fences around them, like I've just been discussing, which you don't really get in South Africa anymore. Or you don't. Um, so yeah, maybe Kenya, Tanzania, um, somewhere like that. But there's lots of places that I still need to explore uh, before I make any concrete decisions. And I'm getting that kind of urge at the moment for exploration, itchy feet. So maybe it's about time that we do a little bit of a tour elsewhere to change the scenery. I really do love Kenya, and if it wasn't for this job, I would have probably gone back there. Those were the plans before I heard about this opportunity to join Safari Live. It's funny how the world works. Like I said, I was planning on going back to Kenya, but this wonderful opportunity presented itself to me. Just as this beautiful big waterbug bull has presented itself to us now. fine specimen. Actually, you'd like to know why we don't see any baby water back. And I'm... I do not know the answer to that question, I guess, just bad luck, really. We do see them from time to time, I guess, and uh, they must be having babies, otherwise they wouldn't be in here at all. Um, so, keep tuning into the safaris and you will get lucky. But we don't have huge waterbuck populations here. And they are born looking exactly as they will become, or as they do look when they're adults. They don't change much. They're not like wildebeest, for example, who are born a very different coloration to when they become older. So they look just like miniature versions of the adults. Obviously, there's a cute factor, like there is with Impala, who again look like the adults, but are understandably cute because they are tiny. To turn around and show you this beautiful sunset quickly. It's not quite there yet, but the colors that are coming through are absolutely awesome. Ta da! Absolutely, absolutely wonderful evening. 
And as it crested fragment, as meters away from us, calling incredibly loudly, almost deafeningly loud. What an awesome scene this is. And I think we should all get comfortable and just enjoy a few moments of silence. Well, fantastic. And I hope you all enjoyed that little breather and little time for silence and solitude. And I think because we kind of half turned around, we're going to fully turn around and head back the way we came. Again, I'm just going to let you feel the tree crept up on me. <laughs> Near miss. First time we've crashed though on a live safari, that's for certain. So I think we're gonna send you back to James now. Enjoy it. Hello everybody. We're just having a something of a sunset competition, I suppose. I'm just removing the front aerial so that you may have unfettered access to the beauty of the African sunset. Uh, this is not the most spectacular African sunset I've ever seen, and that's not to insult it at all. It's just because that cloud seems to already have dissipated slightly. So far from dumping a load of magnificent rain on us, uh, it is uh, going away. But that is very pretty, very l'orange. Oh, that's, um, that's actually magnificent. It looks like a painting. I wonder how many painters we have out there. If you happen to be a painter, let us know and perhaps paint us a picture of this incredible sunset. Especially if you're a younger viewer, I tell you what, there we go. If you're a younger viewer, and by younger I mean anywhere sort of younger than 85 or maybe younger than 16, send us a picture draw us a picture of that sunset and send it through to us. I'd love to see your impressions of it. This is very stunning indeed. I'm now trying to copy Brian's shot uh, with my phone. Brian is, of course, very artistic. Marvellous. Beautiful. Oh, I haven't plugged myself in. I'm not sure if Jerry's talk talking to me or not. Dropping things, throwing things around the back. So a lovely update from Indiana there, where apparently the temperature is sitting at a fairly balmy 35 degrees, I'm assuming you mean Celsius, at least Fahrenheit, which is astonishingly hot for this time of year, I would have thought. So thank you for that update, and apparently almost no snow, 
which I think is very interesting indeed. Now, everybody, that is the sun. That is not a moon. It does look a little bit like a, a moon. But what you can see if you look at the sun with that kind of um, exposure is I suppose you can sometimes see the, you'll see the aurora, you'll see how irregular the surface of the sun is. See, you can see the great boiling mass of fusion going on there. Now, for those of you who don't know this and those of you who are perhaps younger viewers, that sun that we are looking at now is a huge ball of hydrogen gas, and all that hydrogen is combining to form another gas called helium. And the reaction by which that happened is called fu happens is called fusion. It's the same reaction that happens in a hydrogen bomb. And so there are million, billions and billions of hydrogen bombs going off on the sun there now. And that's where that incredible energy from so far away is being produced. Can you see a sunspot? Yeah. Oh, that thing in the middle. Look at that, everyone. You can see a sunspot. Brilliant. That sort of dark bit there in the middle is a sunspot, which is a dark speck on the surface of the sun. I'm not sure how it's formed. Do you know, Brian? It's a large coronal mass. In a large coronal mass, where there is obviously not a lot of nuclear fusion going on. Is that amazing? And for those of you who don't know, that sort of anomaly that we've seen that's just popped up there would have happened eight minutes before we saw it. It takes eight minutes for the light of the sun to reach us here on Earth. Now, if you're particularly mathematically minded, you can tell us how far away the sun is in kilometers, given that you now know that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Stunning. Billy, in Texas, you want to know where, if I didn't live in South Africa, where in the world I would choose to live? Oof. Billy, I, I would probably try and find somewhere else in Africa if I had to leave here. So maybe, I believe uh, Ethiopia is actually a spectacular place to be at the moment. Rwanda is a nice, stable place to go. Um, Namibia and Botswana are both very beautiful, but they're a bit dry for me. I think I'd like a bit more moisture than that. Uh, maybe Kenya or Tanzania. So I think that's maybe where I'd try and live. But I guess, as with anywhere, you'd want to try and live um, somewhere. And if it worked out, then you'd stay there. And if it didn't work out, then you'd go away from there. And I guess that's how I would approach having to live somewhere other than mag the magnificent African continent. Um, I don't know otherwise. England's a bit wet for me. I think South America, nobody would understand anything I said to them. Um, Australia seems to be a bit regulated compared with South Africa. The States, they wouldn't let me in. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Very interesting question. I have relatives in Canada. It's definitely too cold for me in Canada. Right. Let us go and see the hyenas. We're just near the den now. I want to put me, me sunnies away. You want to wait here, Brian? Okay, Brian wants to wait here and just watch the last embers of the sun go down, which I think is a reasonable, reasonable request. So I think that's what we'll do if it's right with you. Try and work out for me a huge shout out to anybody, a huge shout out to anybody who can tell me in kilometers how far away that sun is given that the speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second, and it takes eight minutes for the sun to light, for the sun's light to reach us. All right, I'm being instructed from the final control that the sunset, although beautiful, is not going to compare with the hyenas. So let us go and see the hyenas. I think that's fair enough. We're not far away, just a few meters.
Hello, Gracie. Nice to hear from you today on Saturday afternoon. Well, I imagine it's probably just the bar. Oh, afternoon in Ohio. Um, you want to know if we get tulips here, because they're your favorite flower, pink tulips, I think you said. Um, Gracie, no tulips here. You can buy them in some of the shops, but they don't grow naturally here. So I'm afraid not. No tulips here in South Africa, Gracie. But we have lots of other beautiful flowers that I'm sure you'd love. Not many this year because we haven't had much rain. One adult, at least. Oh, and the little one, the little one. Just before we go any closer, there's the, my first sighting of the little cub. Look, don't go inside, stay out. Or is it? It is the little one. Look, those are the January ones. Oh, so... Sorry, we've been topped. There's a leopard on the move. Let's go to Scott. Well, we were about to call you back to show you her fresh tracks, but even better, we've got the mother, the queen of Juma. You can see that extra flap of skin at the back of her belly. There's signs of a leopard that's just given birth. And she's obviously just leaving the den now after having checked in on the cubs who knows how many are there isn't it going to be awesome to one day find out but at least we found her and then we can see she's in good shape absolutely awesome so she's heading straight north away from the den the den is behind us and literally as i was calling in on the game drive channel that we've got some fresh tracks of her you could see they were just crisp and well-defined. There she was, in the road, right in front of us. So we're in luck, at least we get to see her. Not her cubs just yet. But who knows, maybe we'll get to see her hunting, making a kill, or she may take us back to where she already has a kill stashed. That's highly possible. Looks like she's just going to drop down into a river, riverbed here, which is going to make staying with her a bit tricky. So our timing was fortunate. I'm just going to show you one last glimpse of her disappearing there, because that may be the end of it. And I wonder. You know, go into the holes there. That... You see, that's very interesting, and I was just thinking that very same thing, Andrew, is that this is the termite mound where some of you may have seen her excavating with Brent, and she may just be going in there just to double check. Is it still a good plan B? Who knows? Maybe her cubs are in there now. Um, but because of the sensitivity around the cubs, I'm not going to go crashing in there to check. Um, but at least we've had a, a brief glimpse of her. We're going to stay here and keep an eye on the situation. We'll be caught, sure to call you back if anything does happen. But like I said, I don't want to off-road here, even though we know that she has excavated here before. Um, we're just going to stop and listen and, and, and see what happens. And while we do that, we're going to send you back to James and the hyenas. Right, so we're still at the hyena then. Very exciting that you've seen Karula, and she seems to be trying to um, excavate some other kind of den. That's good news, everybody. It means that she's obviously still got the cub, and the cub is probably fine and healthy, and that's why she's organizing another den. So that's great news. The little youngster that I saw, that's obviously Madam there that you can see at the den site, at the den entrance. And Madam, we think, is the matriarch. And look at these two. Look at the little leads. Look at our little December cubs here. <laughs> One on the left is D1. On your, sorry, on the right. Look at that. And you can 
can see that because of the little white bit on the right back foot. It's fantastic. I'm just taking a quick shot. <laughs> I'm taking a quick shot with my phone. This is, of course, how Brian and I shot that little video the other day. Fantastic. Beautiful shot. Beautiful hyena. I love how confiding they become because they're so used to us. A few more coming up here. Oh. And that one there, that juvenile, not juvenile, I suppose, but, wow, she is still juvenile. I think is probably um, one of the, maybe juveniles. line there so they have stopped there's a huge drainage line there if they go into it there's no ways we'll be able to follow them through everyone but let's while we can just try and follow them something's going on there. sorry little chaps sorry to disturb you and brian was saying this morning they looked very full one of them there had a very um sort of looked like blood riddled face there they all are they're all standing over there something to have come running down here or smelt something and you can see this hyena in front of us there so excuse my head has definitely got a very kind of i think it's a face full of blood basically that's why it's that color very full belly that's corky Mm, one of them's calling just over to the side there. They are just so fantastic, these hyenas. One of them's laying down. And here comes the other. This one also looks like its face has got some sort of darkened blood on it. So maybe they made a good kill last night. In fact, she's covered in muck. I don't see the one with an injured neck. Well, there are two adults coming now out of the bush beyond us. Let's just wait and I, let's wait here and see if they come past. Covered in muck. Looks like a male to me. I might be wrong, but it looks like a male to me. And there the others come. So let's look out for that female who seemed to have an injured neck. Hmm. 
Bit of a conversation going on there. Here comes the next one. That's all what these two are talking about. I'm just going to sneak a little bit forward. I don't want to disturb them, but... Yeah, in fact, I'm not, because here comes another one past us. say that the sun is 93 million miles away from the Earth. Now, did you work that out using the information that I gave you? Or did you just know that? I always have to work it out. I can never remember it. Thank you for your answers. 93 million miles multiplied by 1.6 will give you the number of kilometers. So it's about... 140 million kilometers, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just ease our way in here. All right. For a while, I think mistaken is June, and why she should be a bit nervous of the vehicles, I'm not sure. Anyway, they're all around there. And I'm not sure if we can... Oh, there's some cubs there. We'll try and ease around that way. I'm not sure if it's possible to ease there, then. Make a bit of a noise. Two heads, everyone. around here. Now oh, they're coming back. <laughs> Let me just stop here. And there's one in the den. This is actually, this will work out fine. what I was hoping for. Some good quality time with the hyenas. Gerda, I agree with you completely. You say there's never a dull moment here at the hyena den. No, there isn't. There's always something fun going on here. Little one now, too close for Brian to film. He's in currently investigating Rusty's left front tire. Lots of talking going on. I'm just keeping an eye on the hole to see if the little ones don't come out. Brian, can you even see this one? Is that safe? 
less than sort of three feet. I think that's D2, if I'm not mistaken. No. It's probably actually November. Apparently I've sounded a bit muffled. It's because I dropped my microphone off my shirt somehow. That should be a bit better now. Now I'm loathed to reverse and smash. I'm going to have to that. I'm going to just reverse, try and reverse gently over this log so that we can get a view of those interacting hyenas there. Okay, Brian? There we go. It's not too bad. How's that? Is that right? There we go. Well, this is, I've kind of been under the impression that come sort of 20 minutes before dark that the adults go off and forage. And, but maybe I'm wrong, but certainly it would seem to have been the case the last few nights. But I think maybe because they ate last night, or it looks like they ate last night, they're hanging around a bit longer than they might ordinarily. Anyway, lovely to have them all out here. Everyone seems to be fairly, on fairly friendly terms. No sign yet of the female with her um, injury. Not that I've seen anyway. That's Corky there. Well, that's, sorry. That's Corky there in front of us. She had a good meal last night. <laughs> See how close they are, they love the... That's an interesting one. The, the hyena with a neck wound, apparently Jamie said, was, may well have been spending time away from the den because of its neck wound to get away from the cubs. Perhaps the cubs were licking it and irritating her. Yeah, my, that could well be possible. May well be why she's not here. And I know there was a hyena the whole day at the Gallagher waterhole, and perhaps that was her. I didn't see it myself. Now, Paul Rizzo, one of these hyenas I think is June you say does do I recognize her at all I thought it was that kind of light colored one that we've just been watching but I've just seen that there's another one and I wonder if they aren't one of them isn't Bella uh, this might be June right next to us there I think that could be June it is just spectacular actually look how close they are isn't it wonderful And it does look like they're ready to start chewing tires indeed, as Jerry says. I'm trying to get a shot of how close that hyena is. I'm not sure that my camera managed that though in this light. <laughs> what a wonderful privilege this is. Oh. 
Yes, Nicole, very good point. On Twitter, you say porky corky because of... Shame, some unexpected technical difficulties there over on Mr. Henry's vehicle and the little pea shooter, the little camera that they've got has been playing up. So obviously they're just going to need to change the battery. There's still a chance you'll get to see him before the end of the safari and sorry to rush you away from the hyena den. It sounds like you're all having a good time there. It's some interesting action going on. I'm not too sure what happened in the end with the audio and the hyena running off in different directions, but some excitement certainly. Now an update on Karula. We stood by uh, where you last left us for quite some time. She didn't appear to go further upstream. And then what we did is we looped back and did a very, very big wide arc. And from about 40 meters away, we got a view onto the other side of that termite mound. It was through bushes. There's no ways that we would have been able to show you with the camera from that distance. But she was lying up at an entrance within into that termite mound, but just on the other side that we saw disappearing around towards. So who knows? Maybe she's already moved the cub cubs there, or maybe she's just going to lie there. Um, we don't know, and I guess we're never going to know the final answer to it. But as soon as I established that she was there, I just moved out, and like I say, we can guess as to whether she's moved the cubs or not, but there's no way of being certain, and I don't want to spend any further time in that area. Again, we're treating it very, very sensitively, and I just wanted to confirm that she hadn't moved off where we could relocate her. And obviously, if we keep finding her heading to that spot and not to the old den, or the confirmed den, then we'll be able to fairly safely assume that she has moved them a short distance for whatever reason she may have wanted to. Matty, how are you doing? Good to know you on board with us again. And you'd like to know if she would ever bring a kill back to the den. And no, they they certainly wouldn't. She would leave the kill far away because if she brought it back, it would mean she could possibly bring lions and hyenas and other animals that also want to feed on that kill. Anyway, I need to race you back to the den. Bye-bye, Matty. So the little ones, the little babies have come out again, briefly. So this is January 1, and I think there's a January 2, isn't there, Brian? I've only ever seen one of them. That's the first time I've seen it. Was there, were there two there? Now, of course, this is all going to get very confusing when they start to breed again this year, and we have a second... Um, 2nd June, 2nd November. But we'll cross that. Oh, there they are too. Look at them. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, wow. So just to reiterate, this is my first time to see them. We knew they were here. Twitter, I could not agree with you more. You say hyenas are just the best. They've shown us some drama. They've shown us emotion. They've shown us high action. Absolutely, I think that they are just the most fantastic creatures. And we have been so privileged to spend the amount of time that we have with them. Isn't that wonderful? So sweet. Now she, unlike any hyena I've ever seen before, seems to go almost into the den to, to suckle them. So she sticks her backside right inside. Ah, 
Now, now, Alison, Ohio, you ask an interesting question. You want to know if Corky and Madam are the same hyena. Uh, Alice, they are not the same hyena. Madam, we think, is actually the matriarch. And she is most certainly not the same as, uh, as Corky. Madam, that's Madam there that you're looking at. And Madam has got the kind of, a, she's got scraggly ears. And then Corky, where that, exactly the part of the head there that you can see on Madam, on Corky, that's got three very distinctive little scars on it. And this directors are just saying to me they don't think this is madam because the ears are, are not, yeah, I think they're right. The ears on this hyena are not nearly torn up enough. So that isn't madam. Maybe a younger sibling, at least an older sibling of the two cubs. And that's why she's kind of looking after them in the hole. That's really well noticed. Hello, Billy, you're on Twitter and you want to know if I'm afraid that a hyena might jump into the vehicle ever. Billy, I'm not, um, because I've seen many, many hyenas close by like this and they've never jumped in the vehicle. It's a bit like with the lions and the leopards. Uh, they just are very comfortable around us and so they don't tend to feel like jumping into the vehicles at all. They don't see us as something to eat. They don't see us as a threat and so they're very confiding about it. All right, I'm afraid we've run out of light, everybody. The camera's pushed to the max. So we're going to leave here. Okay, that's going to be it from me. Let's head back across to Scott. He can tell you, or have you, for the last few minutes of the drive. Thank you, Brian, for everything well done. Thank you to the final control, and we'll hand you over to Scott for the final minutes. There's the thumb. See you tomorrow morning, bright and early, 05.30. See you then. So happy you did get back onto James's vehicle at the Hyena Den. Wonderful stuff. And I think I'm overdue a visit there and probably worth popping in maybe tomorrow morning before Nikki and I head off for one week of leave, which we're really looking forward to. And we're going to be staying locally in the surrounding areas, doing some exploring in the Drakensberg Mountains that we haven't been able to show you for quite a while. It hasn't been very clear. Some of you will know that mountain range off to the west, and that's where we're going to go and do some exploring, as well as in the Kruger National Park, so looking forward to a week break. So maybe the hyena down in the morning, but I also think we're going to certainly probably pop across to Inyala Road South, which is where we got that glimpse of Karula, just to see if there's any further sign of her in the general area. And it'll be try very nice to spend as much time as possible even though we may not get as much info as we would like from the sightings of her at least by spending time there we're just going to increase the likelihood of getting to know a little bit more about what's going on in and around that den time to say goodbye and thank you very much to everyone involved including jerry who directed the show nikki who lended her hand well done andrew on camera and of course to all of you for joining us and if it wasn't for you joining these safaris wouldn't be possible so thanks for not only joining but also for contributing and interacting with us and we will see you all for the sunrise safari in the morning Toodle -doo.